Dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this virtual talk. My name is Roman Notz and I'm a research associate at the Chair of Metal Forming and Casting at the Technical University in Munich. I'm going to give a talk about the semi-automatic approach for the generation of non-proportional load paths. My presentation is divided into five different parts. First, I would like to give a short introduction motivation, followed by the used experimental setup and the cruciform specimen design we have used. The third and fourth part, part are the results and the control loop we've used, so the main part of this talk. And finally, I would like to close with a short summary and conclusion. Let's begin with the introduction and motivation. As we all know, the most sheet metal parts have a complex strain history. That means that we do not have a single strain state from the beginning of the forming process until the end. Therefore, a standard linear forming limit curve obtained from a Nakajima test or a Marciniak test is not able to predict necking for those parts. Therefore, we have a big problem, especially for industrial sheet metal parts, how can we predict and prevent necking after such complex strain paths? There have been proposed several models to predict necking after these complex strain paths. For example, the EMFC model of Professor Hora, the PEPS model, or the generalized forming limit concept model. Those models are quite accurately, but we have a problem to validate them in a laboratory scale. As we can see here, this is one approach for non-proportional load path we are using at our institute. We create a preformed specimen on a modified Marciniak tool on our hydraulic press. In a second step, we cut out the Nakajima specimens from those preformed specimens, and subsequently, we are testing it on a Nakajima test to obtain bilinear strain path combination. As we can see on the left-hand side, we are using a lot of material to produce one single preformed Nakajima specimen. Also, we need two different machines, a big hydraulic press and the Nakajima testing equipment. And also we need two different tools and two different optical measurement systems to um, calculate the strains after preforming and in the Nakajima test. That means this whole experimental um, setup is quite complex, time consuming, and to the amount of material we need, quite expensive. So the aim of this research is, is it possible to create arbitrary non-proportional load path with one single specimen following a given strain path from simulation? And therefore, I would like to present the experimental setup and the cruciform specimen designed we design we have used. At our institute, we have um, developed a drawbit tool consisting of four independent drawbits, which have an adjustable height from zero to seven millimeters. The drawbit heights generate different strain ratios and strain states inside the specimen and therefore increasing and decreasing strain path ratios are possible. The height of these draw bits is, is adjusted by a wedge, which is pushed against the draw bit and therefore leads to the rise of the draw bit. The higher the draw bit, the stronger the retention forces in the arm of the specimens are. To use this tool, we have created a cruciform specimen. This specimen I've presented at the last IDDRG in Twente consists of three single layers of metal, which are welded together. The top and the bottom sheet metal have a hole in the center. This leads to a reduction in thickness in the center of the specimen with a ratio of three millimeters thickness in the arms and one millimeter in the center of the specimen. This thickness reduction ensures that the crack and the failure after the strain path occurs in the center of the specimen. With this setup, the drawbit tool in combination with the cruciform specimen tool, 
leads to a significant reduction in experimental effort to create non-proportional load paths. This is the case because we only need one tool, one machine and one optical measurement system to create non-proportional load paths. And another benefit is that we are using a lot less material for this specimen. But currently we can only create the strain path by setting the draw bead of the Nakajima punch. So no other effects are taken into account and we can see the strain we have reached only after the experiments. To overcome this problem, we have um, updated our measurement system, the RME system, so it's able to do inline measurement of strains during the experiments. And we use this data we obtain from the optical measurement system in a control loop approach. Here we can see the setup of the control loop. On the right hand side, we have the draw bit tool and the cruciform specimen. The strains in the center of the specimen, which are only measured in the area with a reducted thickness, which has a diameter of 12 millimeter, is measured by the DIC system. Due to the small area, we are calculating and measuring the strains we are able to measure the strains with a frequency of 8 frames per second, which is already quite close to the suggested frames per second in the ESO norm for Nakajima testing, which is 10 frames per second. So we can quite precisely and on time calculate the strains we have currently on our specimen. The strains are then transferred to a lab view tool via TCP IP. Within the lab view tool, we compare the strain we have measured to a given strain path and we give the information to the test expert software. The test expert software we are using to control the machine, the Nakajima punch and also the height of the draw bead and also the start and the stop of the, of the experiment. Now we come to the heart of my presentation which is the control loop design within the lab view tool. So for each strain path increment, we use the same control loop setup. As we want to follow a certain strain path, we first have to enter the major strain and the minor strain we want to reach in this strain increment. This strain path is saved or stored in the lab view tool and the initial draw bead height is set. Then we start the experiment and we get the measured strains from the Aramis tool, as I've explained before. These measured strains are compared to the, given, to the strain path we have given prior to the start of the experiment. So if there is a deviation between the given strain path and the actual strain path, we stop the experiment, check if we are in the first forming step or not. The reason why we do this is explained later on in my talk. We go to the database we have created prior and adapt the draw bead height according to the database. When the draw bead height is set to the new value, we start the experiment again and do the same path again and check again if we have the target and actual strains in good comparison. If this is the case, we check if we have reached the target strain we have given in our strain path here. If the target strain is not reached, we continue the experiment for so long until we have reached the target strain. When the target strain is reached, we stop the experiment and we begin again from the beginning. We enter our new strain path increment. And so we are able to create arbitrary non-proportional load paths which follow a given strain path. But we also have to take into account that there are several effects occurring due to our experimental setup. For example, we are not able to adapt the draw bead height while a specimen is clamped. That means that after each strain increment or each adaption of the drawbit height, we have to unclamp the specimen 
and we have to put the punch into its initial position again. This leads to a spring back after each strain increment. We can see here that the strain path comes up, we stop the experiment and we have a slight spring back before we can start the next strain increment. So we have to take this effect into account to have accurate strain paths. Another effect we have to take into account, and this is the reason why we have to use two databases, is that due to the Nakajima punch, we have an initial biaxial preforming. This is especially the case if we want to have a uniaxial forming step in the beginning. We can see here that we have a positive minor strain and then we go to negative values. That means in the beginning we have a positive strain ratio which then goes into the uniaxial regime. If we have a uniaxial step in the second forming step, we can see that we go a lot further left and that we can reach the negative strain ratio a lot faster. That means that due to the biaxial pre-strain, we have to take this into account by using two different databases and in our um, control loop, we are using two different databases. And we check if we are in the first forming step or not. A third effect is that for some strain path combinations, the drawbit has to be removed or the drawbit has to be reduced. For example, if we have a plain strain forming step followed by a uniaxial forming step, we have to remove the draw beads. To remove the draw beads, we can see here the initial position of the cruciform specimen. We turn the cruciform specimen by 45 degrees and we just clamp the specimen. By clamping the specimens, we can see that the draw bead is removed and we are able to adapt the draw bead tape as we need it. Or for example, for the uniaxial um, strain path, we do not create any draw bead at all. Um, as this is only limited to a few strain path combinations, we have not yet experienced any problem in creating and removing the draw bead for several times. So there no, has been no failure in the arms because of the draw bead creation and removing. Now I come to the fourth path of, part of my presentation, which are the non-proportional load path we have created with this setup. What we can see here in black is the linear format limit curve for the microalloy steel we have investigated. And in blue, we can see the strain path we have entered into our control loop. What we can see is that, for example, the gray and the red line, which are the experimental results, follow the given strain path quite accurately. They follow it until we reach the onset of diffuse necking. When we have reached the onset of diffuse necking, we are not able to, to follow the strain path we have given because the strain state um, changes to the plain strain mode and therefore no um, no control of the strain path is possible anymore. But we can still see that for the, for example, for the first two and three and a half forming steps, two and a half forming steps, we are quite accurately following the given strain path. What we can see here, also in black, is that very small strain increments with a major strain of 0.05 are realizable with the proposed inline measurement due to the fact that it is quite precise and we can stop the machine immediately. What we have done here is that we have um, calculated the experimental onset of localized necking with the red squares and we have compared those results to the predicted necking with the generalized forming limit concept. What we can see is that we are in good agreement between the experiment, experimental necking 
and the predicted necking by the generalized forming limit concept for each strain buff. Even though the generalized forming limit concept is based on a bilinear database, we are able to predict necking even after for the black strain buff with four different strain ratios quite accurately. So let's come to the summary and conclusion of my presentation. We have shown that we can create arbitrary non-proportional load paths with the proposed cruciform specimen design from a laser valid cruciform specimen. Due to the setup, we have reduced the experimental effort significantly by using only one tool, one specimen and one optical measurement system. And some effects arise due to the experimental setup, especially the fact that we cannot adopt the draw bit height during clamping or while the specimen is clamped, and also due to the hemispherical form of the punch we have used. But when we take all the three um, effects into account, we have explained before, we can see that our experimental setup and the control loop design is able to follow a given strain path quite accurately. And also we have shown that the prediction of necking after a very complex strain path with up to four different strain path ratios are in very good agreement with the results from the generalized forming limit concept. With that, I would like to close my presentations and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much.